Hello. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. How are you? Good, thanks. Sorry to keep you waiting. I just got out of a faculty meeting. <laughs> We might have a small group today, huh? They're dropping like flies. Hmm. Well, let's go ahead and start. Let's just do that and these folks can catch up. So <clears throat> this may be a quick meeting. <laughs> um, I am losing my voice already today. So I wanna get right to it just in case it doesn't last long <laughs> and wanna get right to the business at hand. So I asked for anyone uh, who's willing to have something to workshop this afternoon. Um, our last workshop went really well. And I think that um, it offers a nice forum for folks to sort of see the processes at work and discuss ideas uh, in a safe and uh, and um, uh, constructive uh, environment. So I will ask that again, as we workshop either uh, your inciting incidents or call to action materials that you were asked to prepare, or if you have something from last week that you want to share, um, I think that would also be okay. Um, so I'm looking for a few things. So I, I just want to refresh your memory about our inciting incident, our call to action. So I'm looking for you to describe in your work, uh, the dynamic event that's drawing your reader into your story. And, uh, if the inciting incident is the first major event, uh, in the telling of your story, um, what's the primary cause and then how does it affect the events that follow? Uh, and how does it interplay with your um, progressive complications, your overall crisis, and will it or does it affect your climax and resolution? So the assignment was to just describe the inciting incident that you're using in your final project. And in a, in a brief description, one to two pages, just give us the basic idea of what's going on. Or you could actually just show us the scene so questions that you might have if you are uh, going to workshop any of these documents would be how does it focus how does the event focus uh on your characters is it addressing inner or outer conflicts are they uh, conscious or uh, subconscious uh, issues does it raise a level of personal conflict or interpersonal conflict how does it go higher or wider? Uh, does it take on battles with institutions, organizations or society? And if it does it go wider still uh, and present struggles against forces like the environment? Uh, in other words, is it possibly a global event? I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in my case, uh, my character has like two call to actions. Mm -hmm. The first one is where she gets like really drunk and then she analyzes her whole life and how everyone around her has been like really rude to her. And that makes her check in to this place, into this rehab center. Mm -hmm. But the second call to action is like when she realizes that she needs to be in this place because her outer space is just like not, not what she likes and not um not a comfortable place to be okay do you have the document to share or is this just a broad question about your work 
it's just like my question because I was uh, planning on doing like uh, a scene, like writing a script where we see where my character breaks down and this is her call to action that this actually might be her place to be. Okay. So your first, so you're saying that your inciting incident is her having a, a, a an event that requires she go to rehab or is it elective that she goes to rehab she made that decision but okay. in a moment where she was blacked out okay so i i'm of the mind that these you can have more than one inciting incident in your in your story and I'm kind of, I'm of the mind that I think these things work a lot like the beats work in your overall story structure. Okay. There's going to be one principal moment that sort of dictates the whole narrative, right? Okay. And then each subsequent either incident or call to action is going to be the result of, you know, in direct proportion to our result of something that has already happened as the story is yeah. through the acts, right? So I think yeah. it, the first thing would be, uh, the most important thing I think would be to identify which one of the inciting incidents that you have identified is the one that is responsible for the overall narrative. So is it her election okay. to go to rehab or is it the incident where she's blacked out and perhaps taken advantage of or you know, hurt or harmed in some way that brings her to the conclusion that rehab is a necessary thing. Right? Okay. I think there's going to yeah. be one that, that really has that there's going to be one that sets the whole story into motion. And then there'll be several more that arise out of subsequent conflicts. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, so for sure. Conflict oh. is she doesn't have a supporting environment, right? She has yeah, an yeah. incident that has left her impaired or devastated or, injured in some way the response to that is i need help and then looks around no immediate support therefore must go to rehab and you see how one thing begets the next thing begets the next yeah so i was planning on doing like a script for this assignment but i don't know if a, a treatment or a resume of that instant will be better whatever you think best illustrates this event because it's important right if you yeah. want to if you, you know if you want to work it out if it's a dialogue driven problem maybe doing a script is the right way to go if it's simply a a detailed description of the action and the events that take place um, and then identifying the key moments as the initial inciting moment and then the subsequent uh, calls or responses to action, I think that would be okay too. I think whatever best communicates um, what you're doing and, and shows us that you've identified the, the, the key moments properly. Okay. Okay, now I have a, a more clear idea. Thank you. Okay. So... Um, I'm, I'm offering the uh, option of, uh, you know, sharing uh, these uh, documents if you're ready. So I, did, I made them do on Sunday night, so I realize that you may not be ready yet. Um, so I'm also suggesting that if you wanted to talk about any of your uh, Bible documents from last week, that that would be okay too. So, you know, new treatments, new uh, um, beat sheets new character dossiers, um, you know, new pitch packages, whatever. If you have something from last week that you feel is ready to go, um, we can look at that too. Does there, is there anyone who is uh, willing or ready to offer up? Actually, I could uh, with my new treatment. I did it about this character that has like an alter ego it's like a creation of his head but at the same time he's like another character is this a new project for your final work or is this a carry forward from your previous assignment 
Or from, it's from my previous or, assignment. It was from, from my previous assignment because I discovered that my story and it, um, even the, the whole series could be even more interesting if we had a character that by the end of season one, uh, we could have this character as, we could reveal that this character isn't really real. Okay. It's just like a, cons um, like a mental construction of another character. Okay, and is there anyone else that has material that they would like to talk about today? Particularly we if can, you haven't done it before? Yeah, we can workshop my um, character dossiers that I submitted last week is that, after Natalia. All righty. So let's see if we can squeak them both in. Um, I think we can. Um, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, Natalia, since you've been, you have workshopped before, is give Tatiana the floor and then we'll go to your uh, project uh, second. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, Tatiana can, can go ahead. Also, Professor Walsh, I'll need to leave like at 2.50 on the clock because I have a volunteering at 3. 2.50 or 2.15? 2.50. Oh, okay. Gosh, that's over an hour from now. Hopefully we're, uh, we're good. Yeah, 2.50, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <two> <laughs> <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, yeah, we'll just uh, make sure that we... Um, we give uh, each of you uh, a solid half an hour and that'll leave us 10 minutes to wrap it up and uh, you know, whatnot. So uh, if that sounds good to you, go ahead, Tatiana, you can lead off and I will uh, stop you uh, around um, 2.10. Okay, yeah, no problem. Let me um, just grab the files just a second. While we're waiting for you to pull your files, I'll just point out your homework then. Um, I pulled a really uh, interesting video for you folks to watch. How many of you, if any, have seen the film Requiem for a Dream by Darren Aronofsky? I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it's a little bit of a downer, but it's a very good film. It's a very good story. Um, and it really, uh, it really helps as a, as a, as an educational tool, as a lecture example, because it follows all of our, our mechanisms and our, and our, um, uh, approaches to writing, um, like, you know, it's a perfect fit. So, um, I have a nice analysis for you about the structure of self-destruction. And I want you to look at this video. So the, 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 the speaker is talking about the characters and their downward spirals, spirals of, of, of self-destruction. And, you know, um, uh, it's about drug addiction and it's about a lot of things. But I also want you to look at it in terms of the opportunity in your stories to have these recurring incidents that are moving the characters forward through their, in this case, living nightmare of, of being addicted to heroin each you know each act there's something that is just hammering these characters and requiring more of them requiring you know or beating them down even further it's not just the one inciting incident in the beginning that sets a miraculous journey into into play but it's a series of incidents that keep pounding these characters down to the point where they um, they have a, a hero's journey that really is a, a negative experience and not a positive one. So check it out. It's, um, it's on the link here, and I've put the link in web courses for you. Uh, check it out. If you haven't watched the Cinematic Universe yet from uh, Cinema Cartography, uh, I asked you guys to look at that on Monday. It follows the same uh, tone. And then, of course, your ongoing project uh, should continue. So that's your homework. Um, so let me um, kill the screen share for now and turn the floor over. Are you ready, Tatiana? Excellent. Yes. Okay. Let me. Do you go need ahead me to this. make you a co-sponsor? Do you need to show us a document? Um, yeah, I'll have to share my screen. Okay. So let me do this for you. I will make you a co-host. 
And so now you can show us your screen. You should be able to. Okay. this one okay can you guys see it yes okay um let me move this out of the way so i can see it okay um do you want me to just read the whole thing or is it easier if everyone just reads it or no go ahead i think that that, that helps if i read it yes please okay cool um, so just a quick um, kind of synopsis summary of my story. It's basically about a bunch of explorers being sent into the former area of North America, which is now like a kind of a wasteland. Um, so they're going on this big journey to kind of explore it and see what's out there. Um, and, you know, there's obviously going to be a lot of surprises along the way, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I kind of have a larger group. So the way I kind of wanted to structure it was by having a larger group and then focusing on a certain um, a certain few within that group. So I wanted to start by doing the character dossiers for the certain few um, and then kind of branching out from there to kind of understand how the how the clicks are going to kind of form within the group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I already did the character dossier the first time that we had the assignment for Mariana. She's going to be the first protagonist that we're introduced to. Um, so I don't have her character dossier since that was the one that we submitted a while ago. Um, but this is another one of the main characters who is going to be in the pilot and that will kind of fall back on her perspective a lot. So um, her name's Ari. So Ari comes from the hyper spiritual nation of Kana. She has always been hailed as the touched one due to her extremely rare light colored eyes. From the time she was a baby, neighbors would come to her parents asking for spiritual blessings from the light eyed baby. Ari never thought she minded it as it was something that's always been natural to her. To her, it was normal. Her family has always been honored with prestige and showered with gifts as offerings to the touched one. On Ari's 13th birthday, Ari went to the local marketplace to do some shopping. While picking out fruits and vegetables for her mother, she was approached by an older man. The man complimented her eyes and began describing the way he could see into them deeply like the sky. Ari felt mesmerized by the man and her, felt frozen as if in a trance. He, he began to lead a dazed Ari out of the marketplace until suddenly Ari was snapped out of the trance by the arrival of an ugly shadow-like appearance that had no face, only darkness. The figure demanded she wake up and go home immediately. She was afraid, so she jolted away from the man and ran home instantly. Ever since, her friend follows her her as if it were her shadow. She hasn't named him as if she were to name him, that would make him real. Her friend follows her constantly, always providing her clarity and protection. This friend is the source of Ari's clairvoyance and provides her, provides her guidance in a conversational format. Her friend has surely saved Ari's life multiple times, starting from her 13th birthday when her friend kept her from leaving with the mysterious man. Ari tries to ignore it as much as she can. She almost feels as if she's cheating in life by having her friend guide her through every obstacle. She feels as if she doesn't deserve the knowledge about the world that her friend provides and she does everything she can to block it out. Ari's best friend is Jude Mansa. Jude and Ari have been tied together at the hip since they were young children. When Jude's mother passed away under mysterious circumstances, Ari's family took in Jude to keep him well fed and sheltered. This only caused Jude and Ari to become closer despite frequent warnings from her friend regarding Jude. So what does she want? Um, she wants to ignore her friend and live the normal life that she's never been able to experience. She no longer wants to be the chosen one. Um, but what does she really need? She needs to accept her gift and learn how to harness it. And what is preventing Ari from getting what she wants? Her friend continues to help her save her own and others' lives in the danger of the wild land. She has too big of a heart to allow people to get hurt if she's able to stop it. So basically this character, it's someone who is clairvoyant so she can see kind of what's going to happen, um, but in a different form that than you normally see like in movies and TV. So it's it's actually a, a figure that she calls her friend because she doesn't you know, know what else to call it. Um, but it's like a shadow kind of figure that talks to her and he's like, hey, don't do that because something bad's gonna happen. So that's kind of the background of that character. So that's the first one that I have. This sounds like an expanded um, uh, backstory and uh, character dossier because I remember you talking about how Ari wants to ignore her gifts and lead a normal life. 
So what's new is your description now of the manifestation, um, which is which is very interesting. Um, so I have a question for you about the mechanics of that. So is the um, is the manifestation a an actual entity, or is it just the personification of her her psychic ability? In other words, is she creating this uh, in order to wrap her head around the notion that she has this? special ability uh, or is it really an entity that has now uh, teamed up with her you know I was trying to figure that out when I was writing this and I think I'm not completely tied to my answer yet I think it could still change but I think it's her manifestation of it I think that it's her mechanism of, of coping with it and she thinks that if she turns it into another not necessarily a person because it's kind of like a weird shadowy figure but if she turns it into someone else and it's more of a conversational thing then she won't feel as weird about having these premonitions and she won't feel as different about having these visions does anybody else have any thoughts or questions about that Never quite sure how long I should wait before I dive back in and save the silence. Okay, uh, so here's here's my thought on it. Um, I agree with you. Um, I think the low hanging fruit here would be to take the low road and say it's an a being that has somehow psychically bonded with her using ESP, um, and it really I think ignores a real obvious opportunity that you have in terms of um, if we think about the uh, if we think about the hero's journey story structure for instance there are a couple of opportunities where um, the story stage that could present itself um, I don't think meeting with them with the mentor is is necessarily correct because I don't think you can mentor yourself but I'm thinking more along the lines of, uh, internal discovery and then the return with the elixir and the elixir would be the knowledge that she has matured into the understanding of what her abilities are and she has learned how to use them and as a result perhaps the entity will play less of a role in her adult life as she matures into her newfound uh, abilities right and so what the entity represents when she's younger is the tendency that I think all human beings have, which is to deify things that we don't understand, right? Which is the whole bedrock purposes of, you know, structured religion. And when, when, when experience and science can't offer answers about the world, we have a tendency then to attribute them to these supernatural beings. And I think that it, it's kind, it kind of resonates like that for me. That's what I'm hearing. And so if you're thinking in the same direction, I think that that makes a very compelling character because now we're going to be able to really see her growth and her arc, right? She's going to start from an immature place where she's basically hiding her head in the sand and afraid of the ability, doesn't understand the value of it, has no way to control it, right? And she's going to go from that individual to an individual who masters the ability, sees the world in a new way with a new point of view and uses the ability for good or evil is almost irrelevant. But the, but the idea that, you know, she comes into an understanding of what this is and no longer needs the psychological crutch of having to attribute this ability to someone other than herself. I think that's a really interesting arc. And if, if you're going to follow that, you know, in some way, I think it's going to make for a really great character. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I feel like this character is very interesting in that it has a lot of um, traits that you can play around with and that could add like a lot to your story. Thank you. Yeah, and there's lots of room for now. There's lots of room for these little, these little inciting moments that can tease her out of her, her, her fear and her and her hiding within herself, and bring her out into this this journey of uh, really. So it sounds like your story is going to have all this interesting backdrop, which is going to facilitate a much simpler idea, which is 
coming of age, maturing, right? And, and yeah, growing, sure. growing into your adult abilities, awareness, and understandings of the world around you. And so the rest of it is really just uh, an interesting tapestry that defines a much, much simpler idea. And that gets to the root of premise, right? And it gets to the root understanding about how subtext is going to help you in a lot of ways. Um, and therefore, um, if you can trust in these structures uh, and these approaches to your writing and, and stay on a path that that is, um, I'm going to say traditional for lack of a better word, because what it will do is the traditional path will keep you on a path that will run parallel with audience expectation, right? Because the audience has seen these types of characters before, even if they don't know how to deconstruct what you're doing and call it a hero's journey and tell you the stages they're going through and identify the, the iconic um, character, right? Um, they, they somehow know it before. Luke Skywalker is a perfect yeah. example, right? He's the same kind of guy. He's got this thing inside of him that he's afraid of. He doesn't know how to control it. Other people understand it better than he does. He's going to avoid trying to use it and rely on other people until he must embrace it and then grow into his understanding of it, right? So in that sense, our audiences are, they're, they're pretty hip to what you're, you're doing. So you don't want to take a weird turn that's going to throw them off track, right? That's why I'm saying if you stay with the traditional structures at this point, what you can do then is fill in all the blanks with your colorful tapestries, your characters, your world and everything, and then structure it in a way that the audience's expectations are also served in terms of what they've seen before. And that's when you get a resonant character, I think that becomes really successful with your audience. Can I ask this question then? So do you feel like the initial appearance of this being is her inciting incident? Or was something, did something happen prior to this that might have set the whole story in motion? Um, I would say, so I would say that the appearance of the being was probably her inciting incident, but this, backstory is not where the story starts off so this would be something that would be um kind of a separate inciting incident from when she goes to the wildland she so her in her backstory that would be her inciting incident um but that's something that wouldn't be revealed necessarily right away um it would be something that would be maybe revealed like through some sort of flashback or something like that and we would see that that very first inciting incident but the when she's introduced it's when she it's a later point in her life so she is still coping with this whole um clairvoyance thing and she's still afraid of it Lucia. but you haven't seen her origin story yet i guess okay if that makes sense let me ask you this question what structure are you working from are you working from television or feature film television okay so that's very that's good then because remember we have an opportunity in our setup in our teaser to offer this story her her first encounter with the entity as your teaser that's your hook right so in the first in the pilot episode of this adventure whatever it becomes in the first four minutes what we're going to see is her her uh, origin story right and then the inciting incident will then come at the end of maybe act one which will happen after the first commercial break so you'll have all of act one then to give us your first image and your uh your your world and show us who's in it and how it functions and then at the end of the first act you hit us with the inciting moment and now we have all of that wonderful information from act one and we have the teaser with her origin story and between those two things those two structures we can now sit back and en and enjoy the series right because you're going to launch her into the first season adventure whatever that is and we and we understand 
we understand a little bit about her. We understand that there's something she's going to be dealing with along the way and that there's this other thing that she's going to also have to deal with. And it, and it may reconcile her to her origin story or get her a little bit closer to understanding what happened to her in the teaser. I think that's a great setup. I think that's going to work really well. And this was, this was a character that I also foresee kind of integrating a lot with the with the wildland and integrating a lot with the natives that they later that they later find out to be there i foresee her as someone who really like gets up close and personal with it whereas the other characters might feel a little bit more distance with it she uses it and that's what kind of propels her forward and propels her to that place that you were talking about where she has harnessed her gift and she has learned how to control it it's a direct result of her going on this journey and her interacting with the people there because I was considering the possibility that maybe someone there or maybe there's a group of people there who have the same thing that she has and maybe she interacts with them and understands how to harness her power from there and it kind of propel propels her forward into being like a, a, a somewhat of a powerful character who knows all this information about herself now and knows how to control whatever it is that she has. Yeah, and I, I think pace is gonna be really important. Um, I think the first thing you're probably gonna wanna do, um, once we see the teaser and we see that she's a special uh, individual, uh, th then the next thing I think the audience is gonna expect is, is that you explain to them the world. How did North America become a wasteland that nobody goes into uh, unless there's something really, uh, you know, out of the ordinary going on, right? So we need to know about that. We need to know about her community, her immediate family, um, and so that we can start putting two and two together. And one of the, the one of the strongest appeals you can make for your audience is to give them enough information to, to tease them along with the story and have them asking more questions, right? What's, you know, what's the world all about? How does she, what does she, you know, eat? Does she have brothers and sisters? What, you know, what's her family life like? Does she have a family? What's her society like? What, you know, is she going to be considered an outcast when they discover that she has this ability or is it common amongst her, her people? You know, stuff like that. These are the questions that are going to start to come up. And so I think that you, you want to start with that. And I, and I don't think you want to give away too much too soon. Think, think about, again, if we go back to the archetype of Luke Skywalker, right? In the first movie, the best he can accomplish is he blows up the Death Star using the Force. But before that, the only other manifestation it made within him was the little floating ball that he fought with the lightsaber on the Millennium Falcon while they were traveling through hyperspace, right? That's it. The first movie, that's all he got of his, of his personal internal ability. And the rest of it was story structure that was setting up subsequent installments of Star Wars, right? In the second movie, what does he do? He goes off and he meets with the mentor and the mentor prepares him for his first real conflict with the real and well, one of the real antagonists, right? Yeah, he's been fighting the empire here and there, but there's one member of the empire that represents a very significant conflict for Luke. And so the second movie is all about the mentor preparing Luke for that initial confrontation. And then that happens and bang, we're out of the second movie, right? And by the third movie, Luke's got some swagger, right? He's walking around and he's choking people without doing anything like Vader used to do. And he's wearing the dark cloak and he's got the black glove and he's all mysterious. And he saunters right into the, right into the, 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 the Imperial base on Endor and, and talks to Darth Vader directly like it's, it's no big deal. And then flies up and meets the Emperor like it's no big deal because he's so strong now with the Force. And we understand that that's something he never would have done before. But now that he's doing it, we understand that he has grown within himself and within his ability. And so that happened over three movies, right? So you might now remember how um, Judd Apatow was talking about um, 
and uh, I think it was uh, Sid Field also, know where your story is going. So do you have a sense of how long this series is going to last? Is it a is it a one season and out kind of thing, like a really extended teleplay, or is it uh, two or three seasons, or do you want this thing to go on in perpetuity? Because remember, if we use the Breaking Bad example, and we use um, and we use um, uh, that character of um, of um, um, Heidelberg, right? He doesn't really reconcile his his self-identity until the last season and the last season took five seasons for him to make that complete arc we we saw it kind of hit an apex around middle of season three and then in season four we start on the downward slope of the bell curve and we see him starting to embrace what he's become and by the end of season five he's gunning everybody down and he's blowing up the world right so that took five seasons. So where's your story going to go? What kind of legs does it have? Does it have three seasons of story in it? Four, five seasons? And then I think pace out your stages of self-discovery to satisfy your audience. Because if you give it all to them at the end of the first season, where, where are you going to go from there? Right. You know what I mean? I would say, yeah, I would say probably somewhere between three to four seasons. I don't think that I foresee it going much longer than that. Um, and I don't think the entire story and arc of all the characters and their journeys would be able to be told in definitely not one season, but probably not two seasons either. So I would say maybe three to four would be the number that I was projecting. Yeah, that'd be a lot of writing. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Anything at all or any other questions that you want to present Well, for me, um, I just find it difficult picturing how long my series will go because I have like all these ideas in mind and I know where my story um, is going to go. But at the same time, I don't know how to pace it to, you know, to tell like, oh, it's going to be like two series or whatever. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. And that's a great question because that's what these story structure concepts are all about, right? If you know what the end game is for your character and if you know what the basic story is, um, and then if you embrace one of these structures like Vogel's extended three-act play where you have the hero's journey mapped over three acts, now what you can do is you can you can put your um, your resolution at the end. You can put your first image at the beginning. You can put your world building stage in the first act, and we can meet your hero. You can tell us your hero's wound right away if you want, or you can discover that down the road. You can give us the inciting incident. And then you have some benchmarks along the way that you can then start filling in. And that's where the writing will, will start happening. Because if you, if you haven't thought about who your character might seek for advice, you have an opportunity to write scenes about meeting with the mentor. Who will that be? Maybe there's an opportunity for a new character that's going to come in and give your hero some advice or a special talisman or a weapon that helps them move forward into their journey, right? That's what these structures are about. This is how they're supposed to be able to help you. You know you know a and you know b and you know c but what happens in between to get them from a to b to c right <clears throat> and you can use whatever structure you're most comfortable with remember some of these folks were breaking it down into 20 23 stages of story you know vogler's breaking it down into 12 i think um uh who was it it was um mckee broke it down into 16 stages um, you know, so whichever one of those structure plans uh, makes the most sense to you, I think if you apply it and start mapping it over your story, I think it gives you a perfect sort of template to start filling in the blanks and, and have your story flow through those stages. Because like I said, the audience is already kind of preconditioned to expect that sort of story flow. 
You don't have to have every one of the stages, for instance, of of uh, Sid Field's story structure or Vogler's story structure. You don't have to have all 12 of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, but you have choices and you can make them pick and choose what you think works best for your story and how you want your story to unfold. Does that make yeah, sense? That's, yeah, it, it makes sense. And it, it is very interesting because now that I think about it, like, um, I don't know if you have watched Bojack Horseman, but I keep thinking about this theory while I'm writing mine. And I'm just thinking on how um, it could be nice to use some of the things that Bojack Horseman uses, which are um, some episodes are just flashbacks from him, mm -hmm. which for me, it was pretty nice. It was like a refreshing episode. And also there are so many episodes where he gets like in this very crazy trip where he gets like um, really high and like with acid and all that stuff. And then he starts like tripping and seeing all this crazy stuff. But at the same time, a lot of his memories and a lot of his wounds appear in these trips so okay let's uh let's let's address that uh for uh, on your turn so let me wrap up then um the uh the presentation from tatiana and ask if there are any other questions or points that we need to address before we move on to natalia's uh work anyone going once Wait, Professor. Yes. Um, so like kind of like what she said about how do you know how to continue, like how, like how many seasons? How do you like figure out what to do as filler, like in between like the start and the end of your story? Well, that's like, what I'm talking about. That go on for so long. That's what I'm talking about. If we were to bring up, for instance, let me uh, let me find my Vogler diagram really quick. Uh, bu, 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 where'd I put it? Where'd I put it? Writing Breaking Bad six stages of story there. Well, here, here's here's Michael Hogue's. We can use that. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> and let me bring up Michael Hogue's structure, for instance. Okay, so here are six stages within Act say maybe across act uh, one and two maybe um we have our world and our setting okay that's kind of an anchor we're, we're going to need that no matter what right even if it, even if you're writing a story about a world that we already kind of know and understand like if you're writing a cop drama right you can still tell us uh what is it about new york city is it a period piece? Is it a contemporary version of New York City? Is it a fantasized version of New York City where there are things that don't really exist in our show, but uh, or they exist in our show, but they don't really exist in reality as part of this New York City backdrop? Um, and then what kind of cops are they? Are they good cops? Are they corrupt cops? Are they supernatural cops? You know, and that, so one should do that you know, then we move into the, the formal sort of three act structure and we need to define our inciting event. What is it? What happens to those characters that sets our story in motion? Okay. And then in the process, you can give us some insight into who these characters are. Let's meet the crew, whoever they are. They Let's meet the protagonist and all the protagonist's friends, and then we'll save the antagonist for the first conflict on the journey, let's say. Um, or maybe we meet the antagonist so we know who it's going to be so that we can be looking for that individual when they arrive at their critical moment in the story structure, in the arc, right? But you can give us that, tell us why, you know, so what happens to the character and then inner and outer motivations these templates are there to help you fill in those gaps and to tell you what what the typical stages are that a story will follow in other words you know the audience like i said has been preconditioned to see stories unfold in this way that's at the root of joseph campbell's um 
uh, studies and research on legends and and verbal uh, traditions anyway is that his his thesis was that we've been hearing stories told basically the same way for the entire uh, evolution of the human species sitting around campfires as cavemen telling stories right and what did the stories represent and and what were the stages of those stories there was always somebody who started from nothing and succeeded at something what was it and what were the what were the um, barriers to success or how did they fail right um, and so these story structures are in our psyche somehow. And all these templates are doing is giving you ways to identify those story points. Which points do you want to put in your, in your script and which points do you feel like you don't need or you can leave out and still tell the story effectively, right? That's what this is all about. And if you, so if you use these structures in these ways, um, ultimately, the, the biggest advantage they're going to, to offer, I think, is they're going to keep you from getting this writer's block problem. Because if you just start filling in the blanks with all the information that you know, and then apply them to the template, you can see where you haven't answered questions from the template and fill those blanks in with story or with character descriptions or with, you know, world descriptions or, you know, better define the problem or create some subtext that will help you make better choices moving forward in the story. Like, you know, why does everybody want the sword? Why is the sword magical? What is it about the sword? How did it become magical? Some swords aren't magical and some swords are. What's different about this one? You know, if you come up with that information and put that in your Bible, then it might present itself as an interesting story line that you can present in your script, you know, where the character, the protagonist is sitting around the fire with his heroes that have joined him on his quest. And they say to him, what's so important about this sword? You know, kind of like R2-D2, what's so important? What's he carrying, right? He's got the plans to this amazing space station that's going to blow up the rebels if we don't stop it. And we need this little droid and what he's got inside, right? So we have these opportunities to follow whichever template you prefer, you know, more complex template or a broader stroke template, whatever, you know, because I, I gave you the, you know, the whole packet of like a dozen of these things and you can look at the one you like. I think Vogler is the most easiest to follow because we've got all of that information from Campbell to support that story structure and, and those 12 stages. Um, that I think that's what this stuff is for. So if you're wondering, well, what kind of stories do I tell, you know? Well, first you have to know what your story is. That was the key point that I made last week. If you don't know the world that your story takes place in and you don't know what the objective of your protagonist is, how are you gonna write this script anyway? You have to know those two things first and foremost. Um, so this is what I'm trying to get at. It's like these things aren't going to come to you at random and you're not going to sit down and write a compelling story just off the cuff. You're going to have to work at this and you're going to have to follow the stages and think about the stages at each step of the way and how they apply to your protagonist and their journey from have not to having the objective the elixir, the artifact, the power, the knowledge, whatever it is that they want, that they're going to all this trouble to get. And then the stages in between are based on the hero's journey, the classic structure of, you know, of storytelling. So that's what this is, right? In reference to your Bojack Horseman question about, you know, using flashbacks to reveal information, that's great. The flashback is nothing more than a tool, okay? No different than if I use a wide angle lens or a telephoto lens to shoot a scene. Each of those lenses has a different point of view, has a different way of seeing the action that happens in front of the camera. One of those points of view is gonna make more sense than the other, right? 
A telephoto lens gets me in close to something important somebody will say. A wide angle lens will show me where that event is taking place. What is the point I'm trying to make, right? So the flashback is nothing more than a mechanism. It's like a, it's like a delivery system for the knowledge that you want your audience to possess after the scene is over, right? So using flashbacks or not using flashbacks don't necessarily have anything to do with how your story arc is going to unfold and the story that you're telling unless flashbacks play a particular role. For instance, um, Memento. Remember Christopher Nolan's first feature film where the guy had only short-term memory and no long, or he had only long-term memory and not short-term memory. So at the end of every day, he would go to sleep and he'd wake up the next morning and he'd have no idea who he was or what he'd been up to the day before. So he got all the tattoos all over his body that gave him clues as to what's happening with his life and, and photographs that he would then use to piece together the events that happened to him just yesterday so he could figure out what he, his purpose and goal was. Uh, and the only thing he had were long-term memories that it came to him as flashbacks that clued him into possibly what his current predicament is, right? So flashbacks in that movie played a very critical role because it's part of the story and it was part of that character's self-discovery, right? But a flashback is nothing more than a tool. You can use it effectively or you can overuse it and use it as an excuse not to develop your story in a way that performance and dialogue would better would better inform your audience, right? Is that making sense? So Natalia, what have you got for us in terms of your... Uh... All right, so I have a character this year. Um, sorry. I have a character this year. Do you want me to share the screen with you? Yeah, or... let's, uh, let me get down into my... Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And then I'll go over to you and I will make you a co-host so that you can now should have the ability to share your screen. You see a little green share screen button at the bottom of your window now? You got your documents ready to go? If you put them on your desktop and then hit share screen, we'll see your desktop if you choose desktop. Yeah, I think, oh, it says it disabled, host disabled participant screen sharing. Hmm? I mean, I can select it, but it says that no. You are now a co-host, it says on my screen. Oh, okay, no, yeah. Okay, sure. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay, so here I have uh, the premise, the same premise. I have the same premise. Where, and now, where is it at the top here? Here. Oh, here it is. Okay, good. A free life is not where you can have it all, but one where you can feel and think for yourself. Okay. Yeah, that one we revised it. And we all agreed that it was good, like it was a coherent um, premise. And then I got what is the secondary protagonist in your journey. Sebastian is a person who struggles to understand himself. His entire life, he has felt that he's not able to do anything despite having a brilliant mind. He's looking to understand himself and find something that truly motivates him. So my new, my second protagonist is like, he's a very brilliant person like he reads a lot and he knows like a lot of stuff from everything but he just feel that he's not enough and that he's not capable of doing anything that's so a that's why broad journey that's pretty broad okay the first thing you got to do is narrow your scope okay okay you have to you have to get more granular more uh go in at a, at a more microscopic level and look for a, a real root problem that you can solve for this character. Before oh, we okay. do that, yeah. let's, let's roll it back to your premise before we do anything. Because remember what La Huchegri said, if you don't know your premise and have a rock solid premise for your story, 
then nothing that follows is going to make any sense to your audience. Okay. So does anybody have any thoughts about her premise? Anyone at all? Thoughts about the premise? the premise? I think the premise is pretty solid. I feel like it kind of, it's, it's more of a theme that kind of could be applied to other things, um, but it still kind of tells like the overall idea. I like it. Anyone else? You know, when I was reading it, I feel like there could be the premise of what you would think it would be like a dystopian world where everything's more like, I'm trying to think of an example. Oh, have you ever read the book Anthem by Aaron Rand? But everyone was just like one way or Fahrenheit 451. Uh, when there's a world like that, that's what my mind went to with the premise, like it being vague, but like vague enough where you could go deeper into it. Anyone else? Okay, so here's what I think. I think that this premise is too broad. A free life is not one where you can have it all, but one where you can feel and think for yourself. Okay, as applied to what? What's your definition of freedom? What's your definition of all, have it all, all of what? But one where you can feel and think for yourself. Well, you, you can already do that. We do this every day, just as simple uh, organic organisms. We feel hungry, so we feed our mouths. We feel cold, so we wrap up in a blanket. We think it's better a better idea to sleep in the house than outside in the backyard. We already can do that. What we need to do is we need to really know what does your character want? You're saying that he's looking to understand himself and find something that truly motivates him. Again, way too broad. Getting to know oneself is a given, right? That's part of what life is all about. We're born into a world. We must discover what that world is. We must figure out how to relate to our parents and our loved ones. We must then discover details in the world that we find appealing, details that we find tasty, de details that we find uh, distasteful, details that we find abhorrent, then we have to create preferences within our mind of what we like and what we don't like. And then we choose something specific that we can dedicate our experience toward, right? So that's kind of the process. And we already know that. What we don't know is who's your hero and what does he want or what does she want? And the, the, as soon as I read this, the Rolling Stones song came, popped right into my mind. Freedom is not a life where you can have it all, but it's the one where you can think and feel for yourself. You don't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need, right? So if you use a framework like that, which is already ingrained into the, into the, the zeitgeist, right? Your audience knows that expression. So then use that expression, I think, to start to narrow down what this is. So you don't always get what you want, but you get what you need. What does your character need? What does your character want? And what does your character need, right? Identify those two things. And then you might have a better idea of what that inner journey is going to be all about, right? What do they want? Why do they want it? Does it represent an advancement of power, money, fame? Does it solve basic problems of survival? What is it that they want and what is it that they need, right? And I think then you'll have a more defined, be able to make a more defined statement than simply looking to understand themselves because that's everybody's kind of doing that by default. I think that understanding how you're gonna get what you want, I think is a little bit more definitive, right? So I want the princess, why do I want her? Because she's beautiful and we could have a family. Okay, but she's in a tower surrounded by a moat. Now I know what I want and I have some idea of how I gotta go about getting it. I've gotta figure out how to cross the moat, then I've gotta climb the tower and then I gotta figure out how to get her down on a rope, 
right? All of a sudden, now we have a story that we didn't have a minute ago, because knowing what, you know, knowing simply that you want to understand yourself is some aspect of the story that I think is going to pres is going to offer itself to us automatically in the way the characters act and behave. Does that does that make any sense? Do you agree? Not agree? Yeah. I, I, I do agree and I do feel that it's too broad. Um, so tell but, us about um, your world. Tell us about the world then. What's the next? Uh... Okay, so what I was about to say is that he, he also had like um, a very specific context where he grew up along with his dad, who is uh, like a psychiatrist. He was a, his dad was a psych psychiatrist, but is now a professor in like Oxford's university, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his dad is like super strict and super manipulative. So um, of course, everything that um, Sebastian uh, made or do or think or whatever, was like drive through the manipulation of his dad. He, so his he was manipulation always, of his dad? Like his dad always manipulated him. Oh, okay, okay. So, all right. So let's examine that dynamic and let's think about, okay, so we have a father who's an archetype, right? He is a spiritual uh, shaman, right? If you look at the archetypes from, from Freud and from... Campbell. So he's a spirit, spiritual um, uh, advisor. And then we have a character who is the offspring of the spiritual advisor. So what are our conflict options? Our conflict options are man versus himself, man versus man, man versus nature. Well, this could be uh, man versus himself. How do I please my father? Uh, or man versus man. The father is strict and narrow in mind or scope. And the son is the opposite. The son is the rebel. The son is the free spirit. Then we start defining a, a, a very basic conflict. So then we might be able to go back to your premise and say, freedom is not having everything you want, but it's having what you need. And if what you need is to be out from under the boot of oppression, an oppressive father, an oppressive society, or an oppressive relationship, then we know, now we know, what does this person want? They need to escape from an oppressive relationship, or they need to escape from an overbearing father. Um, and then it starts to make more sense, I think. So this yeah. is, they're all good things. So you have some choices to make, right? So is the father supportive or the suppressive? If the father is suppressive, is the son uh, subjugated or is the son rebellious? If the son is subjugated, then your story is all about what the son has to do to please his father. If the son is a rebel, the story becomes all about what the son does in conflict with his father to get away from that relationship. So it might be marrying the wrong yeah. girl, you know? It what might it was, be moving to the big city from the country, you know? Actually, that, it goes kind of that way where he's he was very obedient, but at the same time, he was always manipulated by his dad. So he always thought he was doing the things that he wanted by choice, but it was actually his dad manipulating him to do what his dad wanted him to do. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. It does, because... I can tell you what I'm thinking of right off the bat again is Luke Skywalker. In the beginning, we meet this young guy and he lives on a desert planet and, you know, his, his, he's being raised by his aunt and uncle. Uh, where are his parents? That's the first question that the audience has. And so the audience will hang in there uh, for the answer for a short amount of time. And we get the answer, don't we? At their first sit down meal, Luke says, I think the droids are going to work out fine. And if they do, I want to transfer my application to the Academy this year. Now we know that there's, now we know what Luke wants, right? Luke wants to go to college. And then his uncle's response is next year, this year before the harvest, harvest is when I need you the most. And so the uncle is trying to manipulate Luke into not going out to school because there's something the uncle knows that Luke doesn't know yet. And, and, you know, Aunt Baru says, 
you know, when, when Luke gets upset and walks away from the table, we get, we then get some omnipotent information. Aunt Baru says to uncle Owen, after Luke storms off and goes into the garage, he's got too much of his father in him, Owen. And then Owen says, that's what I'm afraid of. And now we understand that Owen knows more about Luke's real father than he's letting on and that Luke is being deceived and that aunt Baru is, is, sympathetic to that but she's not willing to go against owen to reveal what it is and now we have a scenario we're setting it up where it's going to be possible for luke to rebel because he's going to figure out that there's information that's being held from him he wants something very badly he wants to go to the academy and he's being prevented and then the robot runs away which gives him the perfect opportunity to break away from the aunt and uncle for a little while. And when he does, he has a meeting with the mentor. He goes out into the wilderness and has a meeting with the mentor. He meets Obi-Wan Kenobi. And Obi-Wan Kenobi tells him who his father was. And then Luke realizes he's been lied to. And now we start to see how that story gets built and built and built, right? Going through the stages. He could have sat out in the desert in his land speeder, kicking at rocks and figured the thing out on his own, but that's no fun. Instead, we have him go out and he finds the robot, but when he does, he gets attacked by wild animals and he has to be saved by this guy who appears out of nowhere. And the guy says, come on back to my house for a drink. You look like you've had a little bit of an episode here. When you calm down, we'll get you home safe, right? And in the process of chilling out with Obi-Wan at his pad, Obi-Wan says, oh yeah, I knew your dad. Your dad was a powerful Jedi. What? And then all of a sudden we have these avenues we can take, right? And so again, this is what the stages are about is if we, if we trust in the stages and help us bring our character through the plot, through the narrative, um, it offers you suggestions on how to go and how to go about doing this. But first we need to know what, what's your initial conflict? What does your character want? And then give us a, give us a good inciting incident that can set it all into motion. So what sets things into motion for Sebastian? Okay, so the call to action kind of of Sebastian is that he moves from, from Great Britain to New York and he moves in alone. So like all his past and all his insecurities that were built uh, due to his relationship with that, with his dad, he has like a lot of um, child traumas, like growing up with his dad. So he finds himself alone in a room in New York. He doesn't know anybody. So he he enters like in this deep depression, and there's like this moment in he just his memories and his he has like a rage attack or like anxiety attack. Um, so yeah. And then- So and he, why does he run away? Why, why does he run away? Is it to get away from father? Pretty much like okay. he wanted, he wanted just like to-, to So his, his outer journey then is he runs away from UK to the United States. So his, his, out, his outward objectives are he has to learn how to survive now on his own. So if you put him too quickly into an apartment and you and you set him up too quickly uh, in residence in the United States from the UK, uh, first of all, does that make any sense to you? Is that how you think it would go? How did he do it? Where did he get the money from, the means to be able to just move from the UK to the United States uh, and move right into an apartment? Is he homeless in the beginning? He has to learn how to be, he has to learn how to survive on his own. That's his outer thing at the moment. But what about an inner thing? What does he, what does he want? Because you haven't told us really what this guy wants. Have you seen Romancing the Stone? Oh, Michael Douglas movie. Um, he plays a, a rogue living in the jungles of, um, of uh, Colombia and um, he collects rare birds and he sells them for money, right? And this woman, Joan Wilder, who's a writer, uh, has decided that her, 
her writing is getting stale and so she leaves new york city on an adventure she gets she gets talked into a vacation by her editor and she picks just at random columbia and bogota she's going to go there for a vacation spend time at the beach or whatever well uh, in the process of doing this um she uh she she takes a bus into the wilderness on her way to cartagena from the airport and the bus breaks down and suddenly she finds herself in the middle of a jungle in the middle of nowhere uh, with no means, she doesn't speak the lingo, um, and everybody on the bus just gets out and walks away, and they continue on foot. And she's sitting there going, "I don't know how to do this. I'm from New York City. I'm I don't know how to survive in the jungle on my own, and I have heels on and a dress, you know. And out of nowhere, here comes Michael Douglas, right? And he just happens to be out on a bird hunting expedition, and his jeep broke down. So she meets him and says, do you know how to get to Cartagena? And he says, yeah, I do, but I can't because my Jeep's broke down. And she says, well, if you get me to Cartagena, I'll pay you $500. And he says, really? And so he says, okay, that's a deal. So now we, we know who the protagonist is. We know who her helper is. He's not the antagonist, we don't think, maybe, but we don't know for sure. And he has an objective, 500 bucks to get this chick to Cartagena. He, he doesn't know why she wants to go to Cartagena and doesn't really care. He just knows she wants it and she's willing to pay. And so he says, okay, let's do it. But in a private moment around the campfire on the first night, right? She asks him questions. What are you doing out here? I collect wild birds and I sell them. Well, that's kind of odd. You're in the middle of the jungle. Uh, why are you collecting birds in the first place? Because I have a dream, he tells her, and he shows her a picture of a sailboat. And his dream is one day he's going to buy that sailboat and he's going to sail to the Mediterranean and live the easy life, right? And he carries that picture in his pocket of the sailboat. All right. So that's his like long-term inner goal. But his short-term goal is he collects birds for a living in order to save up for the sailboat. But this opportunity of Joan Wilder has presented itself. He can get her to Cartagena for a quick 500 bucks. And so he takes the job. And the story is about Michael Douglas getting her to Cartagena and all the problems they encounter along the way. But along the way, he never lets go of his inner dream, which is the sailboat. And she, in the and we find out that she has an inner wound and, and not necessarily a goal. Her goal was to just relax and go on vacation. Well, that goal has been destroyed in the first scene, right? But we find out what her wound is that needs to be healed. And that is she's written a series of romantic books about this imaginary character who always comes in and saves the maiden at the last minute. And her wound is she's been a writer for so long and been so busy and so successful that she's never actually had a real relationship herself. And she starts realizing that Michael Douglas's character is like the human embodiment of this character she's been writing about for 20 years. And then she starts feeling connected to Michael's character and the two of them start coming together because of this magnetism. All of a sudden, we've created this, this story that has all of these layers to the onion. And it started with an overworked writer living in New York City who needed a vacation, right? But the premise of the whole story is, you know, um, when are you going to stop pursuing goals that never stop coming and how much money is enough when the real thing that you need inside is a genuine love relationship and nurturing love relationship. And then you take that nugget of a story and you wrap the, uh, the uh, uh, um, romancing the stone around it. Right. And so this is what I'm talking about. It's like, so we have all these things. We can look for the conflict opportunities define them but tell us what does sebastian really want why would he go all the way to new york city to run away maybe he why didn't he go to france which is closer why didn't he go to ireland which is even closer than france why didn't he just run up to scotland you can get lost in scotland forever if you want to and you don't even have to leave the land mass so he went to new york city why what would he possibly be looking for that he might find in new york city and nowhere else does he want to meet an American girl and fall in love? Maybe that's his, 
you know? I wrote it here in the dossier. I wrote that um, he wanted to change airs. Like, he really wanted, like, a new, a totally different thing. And that also, like, when he graduated, he received, like, multiple offers to work at magazines. And Life magazine was, like, one of the options. So he chose that one because it was, like, the most far away from his home. So then his inner goal might be what? To become a writer or a photographer, maybe? Is he a photographer or is he a writer? What He's is, a writer. What is, so now we want to give him some some dimension. So your story might want to introduce at an early age that he likes to write. So we could even go back to the initial conflict of father versus son. And the father's really strict, but they're both very highly educated. And the son is a rebel. So what is the son doing that gets under the craw of his old man? He spends his afternoons sitting out under his favorite shade tree writing stories and and coming up with stories and things and he dreams one day of writing books about characters that do heroic things and so this is his issue right he wants to become a writer in the worst way but his father wants him to be following his footsteps carry on with the family business i've got a congregation and i'm responsible for you know uh, a uh, a uh, uh, what do you call it um you know maybe he maybe it's a church maybe it's a spiritual group maybe it's a a community that he's the leader of whatever but he he's thinking the son is going to grow up to take over the reins and be just like the old man and the son's like going no i just want to write stories you know and so maybe that becomes the conflict so introducing that early on and weaving that into your story structure so that your audience can follow it and have more than he just wants to what was your initial goal for your uh for your protagonist. He just wants to understand about himself. You see now why that sounds too broad? Because it is too broad. Yeah, He's totally. Writer. What I think, what I think is that I need to go more in depth yes. with uh, with this character and build up like, you know, and also he has like a very interesting context. So I think that I could play around with those things like with the his oh, daddy yeah. issues and all that stuff yeah so, for sure yeah i mean you you have the makings of a really a classic story really i mean it goes back as far as oedipus from the greeks right the father and the son are in competition for resources the mother the money the power whatever it is right i mean shakespeare addressed the same problem a number of times with father versus son it's a classic conflict the father represents the the passing of the of the old way the son represents the emergence of the new world right these are iconic characters right these are archetypes right out of joseph campbell Right. And, and Lucas obviously robbed these ideas and put them into Star Wars. Right. There's no father figure until the second movie. We realize the father is my God, the antithesis of he's Vader. My God, of all of the people in this universe that could have ended up being Luke's dad. It has to be the one guy that he's got bones with. Right. And then that makes the conflict this penultimate confrontation between the epitome of the oppressive father and the epitome of the rebellious son right and so think about these dynamics and look at the opportunity that you have they're both highly educated they're both motivated right but one wants what we call laissez-faire or one wants every the world to stay the same and the other one needs the world to change and they can't both have it right one has to lose who's it going to be and what are the stakes going to be right so what yeah. i what i think would help you is to really get in there and iron out your dynamics tell us what he really wants now you've told us he wants to be a writer we figured this out right what kind of a writer and then put it in there as early as possible to show that this is his true uh, inner passion right and then the outer passion is dad won't let me be a writer. So I got to get away. Right. So then the outer journey becomes escape. The inner journey becomes, I will become a writer someday because this is what my heart demands of me. Right. 
And all of yeah. a sudden now we have all of this detail that we didn't have before. Now, knowing what we know, can you go back and rewrite your premise? Yeah, I think I'm going to look um, into that as well. I know I, I need to work on this character and then I'll also need to make some arrangement, arrangements to my premise. So Does anybody have an idea what that new premise might be before we have to let her go? Anybody? It might be that you have to follow like, her at all costs. I like, I like what you said about like the Rolling Stones song that you don't get what you want, but you get what you need. So even, I think- Even I'm, finer detail than that is you must follow your passion at all costs. Exactly. So I'll just like look into that and like, have that reference there <laughs> yeah and I, I think that would help you a lot because right now you're you're doing what we call casting a really wide net right so you need to decide what kind of fish you're going for and then decide the best way to catch that fish and it may not be a net at all it might be a hook and a line right so are we looking yeah. at detail um because that's i think detail is easier to do when your scope is narrower right uh, than to cast too broad of a net. And then you've got all of these vast gaps you got to fill in and it becomes overwhelming, right? So really figure out who Sebastian is and what he really needs and what he really wants. And then his problem is, how do I get away from dad to make that happen? Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Walsh. I really need to go now. All righty. Thank, thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye-bye, guys. You. So what do you guys think? I mean, does any of that make sense? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have a conflicting point of view or something to add? I think it makes sense. I think after you talked about it a little bit, I definitely see how the premise could be applied to like different um, stories and it was a little bit too broad. So I think it's a good point that it has to be something that is a little bit more microscopic in view um, of your specific story. Yeah, so somebody said Fahrenheit 451. Who was that? Was that Juliana? That was me. Yeah, so Fahrenheit 451. What was that really about, right? We had an oppressive society. We had a, uh, we had a guy that was in control, like a baron or somebody. And then we had a guy who, um, and the baron's big hangup was, he didn't want anybody to have books. And the protagonist, I forget his name now, um, but the protagonist loved to read and he had, a, he had books. He was squirreling them away, right, in his house and he wasn't telling anybody. And well, while the Burgermeister is out burning all the books he can get his hands on, the protagonist is, you know, he is, is helping this guy, but all the time he has this secret, which is I, I have my own books and I'm not going to let you burn those books right? And then he gets caught. Somebody turns him in, right? And so it's all about an oppressive society versus the, the, uh, the, the, the hunger for information or for distraction and entertainment. And the fact that, um, you know, society becomes very, very oppressive when we don't allow the complexity and the, and the discourse of conflicting ideas um, and that we don't always have to agree with one another to be a society that we can have different points of view uh, and still flourish. Um, there's a lot of themes in Fahrenheit 451. Um, and so the fact that it's a dystopian possible future um, really doesn't have anything to do with the themes of diversity and tolerance and the notion that society can exist on uh, more than one structured point of view, right? And they just happen to wrap it around, um, you know, Fahrenheit 451. Um, so this is where, that's the point, right? Premise gets in deeper than your plot and it defines a basic theme or, or a key idea that is going to be the motivation for your hero and it's going to define in some ways what the hero is going to do um, in its basic wisdom, whatever that, whatever that idea is. 
and you can almost wrap any plot around there that you want as long as you then start dealing with story structure in traditional ways that will help you move your character through that story following the premise and those basic um, um, uh, motivations right and then you color it with your plot you color it with your antagonist and your antagonist hang-ups and the fact that it's outer space and not iowa you know um you know what i mean and so what i think is a as a healthy exercise is to like pick your favorite movie and start breaking it down the way we the way we talk about breaking stories down in class and see if it conforms to these patterns and i'll bet you'll find especially if it was a movie let's say that was quite popular i'll bet you anything that you're going to be able to plug it into the hero's journey um, or the michael hogue six stages of story uh, and it's going to fit pretty comfortably because all of these folks that I gave you all these books about, you notice how the hero's journey is mentioned in a lot of those books I gave you, not just the one by Vogler. It's also in Sid Field's book. It's also in, it's also in uh, McKee's book. It's in, uh, it's in uh, Linda Schmidt's book, right? It's in all of these books because it tends to resonate um, as a, as a, 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 a methodology, almost like the scientific method uh, resonates with almost all the, well, with all the sciences, because it's not information, but it's a way to get at information. You know, we hypothesize, then we experiment, then we record our findings, then we compare our data, then we discuss, and then we repeat, right? The scientific method. Um, and you can apply that to biology, chemistry, outer space, engineering, right? Um, so think about our hero's journey like uh, Lord Byron's scientific method. And then you start to understand how it becomes a tool for you to use. Make sense? Any, anybody have any thoughts on that uh, then before we, uh, we break up? Uh, it's not specific to that, but I was kind of wondering, is it possible that you could uh, have a too detailed premise? Well, if it's too detailed, then it's probably more than one premise, I think. I think. There's going to be a simpler way to say what you're saying. Or you might have more than one. You can have more than one premise. And then you serve them with like maybe parallel storylines. One character represents one premise and the other character might represent another premise. It can work like that. You know, we call them parallel storylines. Um, so I, I'm not saying that you can't, you know, that a complex premise is a bad thing. It just might be more than one. It might be two that you're kind of combining somehow. What, what, what do you, do you have a specific example? No, I was just thinking because um, for the last, uh, like the last assignment we had done, uh, my original premise, I think it was like too detailed that I kind of gave away the story or something like that. Oh, well, then what you might be doing is, is, is confusing premise with plot because plot and premise are two different things. Premise is the theme or the basic message of your story and plot is the details of how the story happens. Right. So they're, they're two different things. So you might have a plot line, not a premise. And so you have to look at, think about just like we were doing with Natalia. What is your, who's your protagonist and what does that protagonist want? And then there may be a theme that's related to it. Right. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about Luke Skywalker, we're talking about a farmer who, doesn't know who his father is and who wants more than life as a dirt farmer, you know, repairing perpetually broken moisture evaporators. He wants to go to college and learn things. So if we know that about him, then we can find a premise that might fit, which is who am I? You know? Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
self-discovery, the quest for adventure. It might be Jim Hawkins, you know? Jim Hawkins isn't necessarily a deep character. He doesn't have any resonant motivations inside. He just wanted adventure. So he signed on with a pirate ship and then he met more than he bargained for. Make sense? Yeah, it does. Treasure Island. <laughs> okay. Looks like uh, we lost everybody. So, <laughs> um, All right. thank you, Professor. Absolutely. Uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks for your time and attention. And I'll see you All next right, week. You too. All right. Bye. bye.